many years ago, Peggy Shoemaker was our guest here at Iowa State University. And since that time, I think she's written 20 books. She's um, written Underground Rivers, Wings Moist from the Other World, The Circle of Totems, Braided River, and Esperanza's Hair. She also, this is the part of her bio that I really love. She worked for the Arizona Arts Commission. She also taught at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. She was chair of the English department. But working for the Arizona Commission of the Arts, she worked with prison inmates, honor students, notice how those are juxtaposed next to each other, gang members, deaf adults, teen parents, little kids, library patrons, and elderly folks. She has given readings in art galleries, a governor's mansion, a clearing in the woods, an abandoned bank, on reservations, in libraries, on a gold dredge, under the hoodoos at Bryce Canyon, on a river boat, at many bookstores, community centers, and universities. About a month ago, a package arrived in the mail, and it was yet another book by Peggy Shoemaker. And the book's called Just Breathe Normally. And I opened it up, and I was breathing normally, but I wasn't by the end of the book. Uh, it's a, it was a book um, for me that captured an experience like none other. Peggy Shoemaker was seriously injured in a bicycle accident, and when you are that debilitated, the cliche is true. Your life literally does rush before your eyes. And this is what the book captures. It unfolds in a succession of prose poems, vignettes. They're just masterfully shaped, capturing her life in the accident and then flashing back into her mostly early childhood life, but then it brings it up to her marriage to her lovely husband, Joe, who is here with us today. It's going to be a real delight for you tonight to hear Peggy Shoemaker's poetry from her book, Blaze, and her prose from Just Breathe Normally. We shouldn't wait 20 years to bring Peggy Shoemaker back again, so give her a warm applause. Thanks so much, Mary. Okay, how's the mic? Not working at all? Okay. How's that? Oh. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Joe and I are staying out at the Onion Creek Farm, and it's such an amazing thing to be in a place where people have taken the care to sow heirloom uh, prairie grass seeds and they have a patch of prairie where the um, grass, I was standing out there today and the grass is this tall and I tried to picture how it might have looked to my grandfather when he came from Norway and there were strands of grass that tall waving all the way to the horizon. It's a good thing to think about, to picture. And also at breakfast this morning there are lots of wild geese flying over and I thought they left Fairbanks about six weeks ago and so they made it here in good time. I'd like to read just four poems from this book, which some of you have, I know. Um, and because I'm going to tell you how books get born, or at least these last two books got born. Um, at the time that I was teaching at University of Alaska Fairbanks, a good friend of mine who is the preeminent painter in Alaska right now, Kess Woodward, we were both furniture. He was chair of the art department, I was chair of the English department. And we'd always say, we should do something together, and we never had time. We were both completely overcommitted. So when I retired and when he retired, he said, bring some poems to my studio. I said, okay, and I gathered up all the Alaskan poems, because he's most famous for paintings that resemble birch trees. He said, really, I'm an abstract painter, but my paintings just happen to look like birch trees. But when, he, when you're up close to them, they're often very large. Some of them are seven feet tall. When you're up close to them, as close as he'd have to be to paint them, they are, in fact, abstract. Anyhow, so I brought over all the Alaskan poems, and then he said in his polite way, if, if you look up courteous in the dictionary, it says, C. Kess Woodward, and he said very politely, I was thinking we might work with the sexy poems. I said, okay, brought over a whole bunch more poems. Anyhow, 
amazing thing happened when I started looking at 30 years of his slides and he started looking at 30 years of my poems. He began to paint and I began to write. And so some of these we put together because they made interesting juxtapositions and they already existed. And some of the poems I wrote in direct response to his paintings and some of the paintings he made in direct response to the poems. My beloved Joe is a pilot, and we fly a 1943 Widgeon airplane. We take off from the airstrip at Fairbanks, and when we get above the Arctic Circle, the gear folds up. Well, the gear folds up when you fly, but when we get above the Arctic Circle, there's a place called Walker Lake where we land on the belly of the airplane. Walker Lake. The sow bear ripped down the boat tarp, scraped black fur into twisted wing nuts. That bear eased her itch and disappeared. And still she stayed near while we hiked uphill to fill our jug, the spring covered over with autumn's leavings. We skimmed clear frosted growth floating, sank our jerry cans, felt them pull deeper. The surface healed around wrists stiff with cold. Bubbles shook free from river weeds, rose up, tumbled downstream. The still place returned to reflection. Birch startled us with gold so loud our bodies flared like fireweed, returned to seed. Twilight put its slant on the afternoon. Four loons swam near our sea plane nudging this strange relative who would not speak. The moon had eaten itself down to the rind, and in that sliver, that lingering of autumn, <coughs> stars borrowed the voices of loons. We live on the banks of the Chena River, and those geese that we saw flying over today and many thousands of others, maybe millions of migratory birds, nest a little north of where we live, uh, and sometimes we get unexpected visitors. This one's called swans, where we don't expect them. Tundra swans twine necks among snowflakes vanishing into evening's river. Past breakup, tablecloths of rotten ice nest along the bank. Halfway, swan wings open, then settle in like second thoughts. Maybe they flew north over Minto, traced halos over brooding ponds, saw from far up, without touching, the world is hard and will stay hard a while longer. You have good long winters in Iowa, so you know how it is when autumn comes and you think, okay, get ready. <laughs> yeah, ours, the ice goes off the river about in May, so we know too. What will remain? Lit from inside, birches spark, flare, blaze trails for travelers outstretched in air. Tawny cranes return to rest where, where earth cradles water. Cranes graze, pace, graze, then flap, scuttle, jabber, scold. This harvest flashes, wingspan of sand, hillside of crooknecks soon to move on. What will remain has always remained. Water seized by ice-driven air. Faith through hard cold that the languages of marsh, sky, sandhill crane will keep on with us or without.
the book Mary, Mary mentioned to you, Just Breathe Normally, came from a very different source. And she told you already that Joe and I were minding our own business, riding bikes along the bike path in Fairbanks, Alaska. A kid on a four-wheel ATV came around a blind corner. Joe's front wheel hit the suspension of the ATV, and he fl flew over the kid and the ATV. And I can't tell you what happened to me, because I don't have memory of the wreck. I was pretty thoroughly squashed. And uh, I came within a few breaths of not being here to talk to you. That tends to change a person's perspective. <laughs> I went from being pretty stubbornly independent to needing help with everything, including breathing. Um, when I could recover enough so that I could focus and so that I could hold a pen, I wanted to live among words again. And I tried to write my way out of that bad place and tried to write my way toward any life I might possibly want to lead. And what ended up coming were these little tiny pieces. Um, part of it was because I didn't have the physical ability to write things that were longer than that, but part of it, I just began to be intrigued with the short form, which apparently is very elastic. You can do a lot of things with it. And if you want to write, and if you want to publish in magazines, I would just give you this small bit of advice. If you write very brief, compressed things, and you write them very well, editors love them. <laughs> yeah, you only have to convince the editor to give you one page. You know, most fiction writers and nonfiction writers are talking 20. So you have a good chance there. Um, let's see. So here's another issue. I'm writing a memoir. I, f I found out later that people call this memoir. Uh, <laughs> but I, I began to question myself because I thought, oh, okay, my memory is damaged. It's fragmented. It is very much unreliable. So how can I write memoir? And then it very much into the process, late in the process, it occurred to me, so is everybody else's <laughs> fragmented and unreliable. Um, but I got to have a chance to work with many different kinds of memory. Some of them are ancestral memories, like this one. My grandpa was a, um, a Norwegian immigrant. Hi, come in, Lana. Was a Norwegian immigrant. Dovetails. My grandfather, John Moen, never forgave his own father. His mother, Hannah Lofton, died young. Not in childbirth, not from malnutrition. She had what in those days women didn't mention to men, female troubles. Her husband, paying off his passage, refused to call the doctor. Hannah grew so weak, a neighbor offered to take her to town. It'll be too much for her, I think, Ingebret said. End of subject. End of Hannah. John watched his mother suffer, watched her yellow, watched her writhe. He snuck in the midwife when his father wasn't looking. She's in a bad way, son. You'll have to get her to town. The woman might as well have said, you need to get her to the moon. He made his mother tea. He held her head when she leaned over the edge of the bed. He planed the boards, fit the dovetails tight. That same grandpa, when he grew up, um, like many immigrants, didn't really understand what prohibition had to do with him. So he was up in Dakota, North Dakota, on the Canadian border. Dakota's not good, Brunstalen. And he, by the way, he was a musician for barn dances. After a full night fiddling four straight sets, after catching Harriet Langley's spitfire eye following his fingers, his bow, after hiding bootleg pints in hollows and burrows of birch, then selling the maps, John Moen slipped back into his bunk. One last sip, and he'd sleep an hour, maybe two, before hitching the bull to the stone boat and driving out past the slough to the North Forty, where more rocks than crops poke through the dust. 
three more months. With his passage paid, he could save for lessons, for airtime, could save enough to fly. Maybe set a little aside for those blue glass beads in Hopkinson's window. Maybe barter a hard week of reading biplanes for an hour or two in the sky. And here's a question for you. You're writing memoir, and are you allowed to put in, in that case, are you allowed to put in things that you don't actually remember, like um, things that happened to your grandfather? Are you allowed, the next one I'm going to read to you is the, my parents' wedding, and I was there, but I was in utero, so my memories are a little fuzzy. You know? I'm just telling you, I put them in. Um, nobody told me I couldn't. And in some cases, when I needed a piece of the story that I didn't have, I would use a rhetorical device. And those of you who are writers will maybe be able to use this trick, but I would simply say, what comes next, I learned from Joe again and again. Or I'd just put a date, and then they'd, they'd realize it wasn't, if it's 1924, it's obviously not my personal experience, and I think that's fair. Yeah. So, by the way, there's a motif that runs through this book called My Father's Wives. My Father's Wife, number one. My Father's Wives, number two. My Father's Wives, number three. It goes up to five. And this is number one. In lust with the whole world, my parents squirmed out of their clothes. Their teenage bodies crashed magnificently against one another, surf undercutting the cliff where they lay. Sex was clumsy, new, unbelievable. They went at it as if they'd just invented it. They went together like beach sand in an open eye. They only married because I was on the way. I figured that out early. They drove to Yuma where a new hatch of crickets writhed, a jumpy carpet, tobacco juice brown. My father's footsteps crunched and slid. Their witness, Aunt Annalise, was wearing new shoes, chunky white platform heels with eyelet cutouts showing her nylons. She didn't want to get out of the car. What do you think, they'll crawl up and get your woolly booger? Uncle Don poked at her. The four of them woke up the justice of the peace. When the parents' screams pierced another midnight, my stomach clenched. All my fault, their misery. We did number one, I'll give you number two. Hmm. My father's wives, number two. After the divorce, things slid downhill fast. Our whole household was an arroyo collapsing in on itself. By the way, arroyo, dry riverbed. I grew up in Tucson. Our whole household was an arroyo collapsing in on itself. Dad married Crazy Marsha, a bottle blonde with a serious affection for prescription painkillers. We nicknamed her daughters for their passions. The Nympho the pyro, the klepto. <laughs> Eating an orange at Marsha's house was a project. First, we'd post a sentry. Then one kid would lift an orange from the bowl on the table. That kid would walk fast to the bathroom. Everybody who wanted in on it came into the bathroom too. We'd peel the fruit, divide the sections exactly evenly, you cut and I choose, then swallow the fruit almost without chewing. We washed our hands and faces, brushed our teeth. We flushed the orange peels, wiped the counter. When Marcia came out of her room in the late afternoon, she'd know right away that something had changed. She'd count and count the oranges. Eight, there should be eight. Seven, we'd say. This time, you bought lucky seven, remember? The day of the moonwalk, I had a date. Chuck Quimby came early to pick me up. We couldn't leave the house, though, because Marcia had an episode. 
She plucked out every hair in both eyebrows and held a stencil high across her forehead to pencil in new ones. She couldn't get them right. Couldn't. Her hands wouldn't cooperate. Irritation slid into hysteria and Marcia got clingy. I pictured techniques that they taught in junior life-saving, the ways to keep a panicked swimmer from drowning you too. We erased the jagged arches over her perplexed eyes. We fed her crushed ice. Her face, bald and sallow, sank in on itself. She looked powdery, like the surface of the moon, marked by boots, by men. Finally, she slept. One small step for a man. As long as we're in Tucson, I will tell you that the Arroyo that I mentioned before is, was the social center of the whole kid universe in Arizona. It's the place that you'd, um, oh, you'd cut your finger to become blood brothers, or the place that you would say, meet you in the ditch if you wanted to fight. Um, and those riverbeds, that riverbed especially, stayed dry all the time except when it was massively flooded. This is called moving water to some. Thunderclouds gathered every afternoon during the monsoons. Warm rain felt good on faces lifted to lick water from the sky. We played outside, having sense enough to go out and revel in the rain. We savored the first cool hours since summer hit. The arroyo behind our house trickled with moving water. Kids gathered to see what it might bring. Tumbleweed, spears of ocotillo, creosote, a doll's arm, some kid's fort. Broken bottles, a red sweater, whatever was nailed down, torn loose. We stood on edges of sand waiting for brown walls of water. We could hear it, massive water not far off. The whole desert might come apart at once, might send horny toads and Gila monsters swirling, wet nightmares clawing both banks of the worst they could imagine and then some. Under sheet lightning cracking the sky, somebody's teenage brother decided to ride the flash flood. He stood on wood in the bottom of the ditch, straddling the puny stream. Get out! It's coming! Kids yelled. Get out! We yelled. The kid bent his knees, held out his arms. Land turned liquid that fast. Water yanked our feet, stole our thongs, pulled in the edges of the arroyo, dragged whole trees, root wads and all along, battering rams thrust downstream. Anything you left there, gone. Anything you meant to go back and get, history. Water so high you couldn't touch bottom. Water so fast you couldn't get out of it. Water so huge the earth couldn't take it. Water. We couldn't step back. We had to be there to see for ourselves water in a place where water's always holy, water remaking the world. That kid on plywood, that kid waiting for the flood, he stood and the water lifted him. He stood, his eyes not seeing us. For a moment we all wanted to be him, to be part of something so wet so fast, so powerful, so much bigger than ourselves. That kid rode the flash flood inside us, the flash flood outside us. Artist unglued on a scrap of glued wood. For a few drenched seconds, he rode. The water took him faster than you can believe. He kept his head up. Water you couldn't see through, water half dirt, water whirling hard. Heavy rain weighed down our clothes. 
We stepped closer to the crumbling shore, saw him downstream smash against the footbridge at the end of the block. Water held him there, rushing on. Sand rubies. The best treasure came to us mostly after rain, when the arroyo rearranged itself to suit the wet. We'd have to kneel at least, or sit quietly for a long time. This meditation turned us into visionaries, ones who could see what lay buried not far beneath. Red glints, stones precious because they disappeared, sand rubies, deep red and transparent one moment, flecks diving out of sight the next. In this way, we learn to savor what's always there, especially when we can't see it. In this way, we learn to love ephemera, <coughs> the sand of the ancient ocean, this earth, this life, everything loaned for a brief time to us. I'm here talking to you because there are very good doctors and nurses and technicians at the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. It's a small hospital, it's a small town. We have about 90,000 people, but we have very talented people who helped my body, and I had many, many friends who helped me. And that said, you know, most of the medical people were absolutely wonderful, and then there was this guy. <laughs> One MRI technician is kind and keeps talking to me all through the procedure. The second time, though, I get a man whose significant other is this machine. He speaks to it, but doesn't answer me. His tattoos, carpeting both arms, scare me. He looks like the kind of guy who nails stuffed animals to trees. I'm surrounded in too small a space. Noise bombards every cell. I close my good eye, recite song lyrics, hymns, every poem I know. The machine hammers all around me. I keep coming back to Neruda's socks, rabbit soft, knit of twilight and goat skin, his feet morphing into blackbirds, cannons, sharks, decrepit firemen. The only way I make it through those two hours is thinking of myself as a fugitive, reminding myself that beauty is twice beauty, and what is good is doubly good when it's a matter of two socks made of wool in winter. My toes turn to ice. Finally, I have to yell. The guy doesn't answer, does not answer. I yell again, long pause, eerie. Did I make sound? He slides me out of the huge machine like a loaf on a baker's peel. OK, I'm through with you. He walks away. His assistant apologizes, helps me sit up. The title of this book comes because um, I went. I was out of the hospital for about three days and suddenly couldn't get air. And they took me back, Joe and his son and our grandson, uh, took me back to the hospital. The surgeon said, get back there right away, don't wait for an ambulance. And when we got there, the guy said, huh, you have all the signs of pulmonary embolism, but you've had, had trauma and a recent surgery, so we can't give you the drug that breaks up the clot. So anyhow, they put me into a machine, and of course the woman said, relax, just breathe normally. And I thought, 
if I could do that, I wouldn't be here. So I realized that any time you get that advice, you can't do it. When you're handed a six-foot rosy bowl, when a tarantula tangles his arm's hair in yours, when you sneak up with a Dixie cup to catch a scorpion, when you're maintaining in front of your friend's parents, when before surgery you're counting backwards from 100, when for the first time you fit a snorkel between your teeth and put your mask into the water, when the dog they said doesn't bite clearly intends to, when you tell that necessary lie, when your scuba instructor tells you to take the giant stride into 200 feet of ocean, when they slide you tight into the MRI tube, when you stand to give your speech, when yellow cups of oxygen fall from the plane ceiling, when the respiratory therapist clips together your nostrils, when the dentist packs your mouth with cotton logs, when you get the news you've been waiting for, when you get the news you've been dreading, when you stand up before God and everybody to pledge your love to your mate, just breathe normally. been trying to decide if I would read this piece tonight. I think I will. Because it means that um, I trust you enough. Lips. My mother had a luscious mouth. Sumptuous. A venomous neighbor, angry about something else, sneered, You have nigger lips. My mother looked her directly in the eyes. Why, thank you, she said gently. The neighbor, disarmed, didn't know what to do. Just because Sue couldn't stand spit, my mother gathered slobber between her big lips and slathered Sue's thrashing face. Good night. In her coffin, my mother's lips looked like wax, Halloween lips without red dye number two. Someone had brushed on a dry orange color, outlining a prim little mouth inside the edges of her lips. Wires held open her nostrils. Her lips were stitched shut, not very neatly. The undertaker's hairdresser couldn't do much with my mom's thin hair. Hair she called WW hair, world's worst. Each fine strand lay flat against her skull. Her hands crossed over her chest, carved by coats posed like carved suet. Why they put the family behind a curtain like the Zonk prize on Let's Make a Deal. After everyone else had filed out, the man with the black suit and funny smell motioned that we should walk, a, walk down a little hallway that led back to the mortuary chapel. It was there, yawning open, the ridiculous box. We paid way too much, money we didn't have. The water and worms would eat through fancy wood just as easily as plain. My uncle, guilty, had refused my mom a $500 loan. She was drinking heavily, and he was probably right to refuse to bail her out again. So he almost went for the concrete-lined vault. I had to say out loud, we don't need that. The man with the funny smell fixed me with a look. And there it was, her body. It held me once, then pushed me 16 years ago out into this world. 
It hit my sister Ginny every day, and the rest of us when we didn't get out of the way. It cradled each of us as if we were miracles. It was sexed and sexed and very little loved by men. It was a constant source of confusion for those of us who loved the woman it held. We never knew if that body would be on our side or if it was another threat disguised as mom. I remember writing the thank you notes after my mom's funeral. My great aunt Jean wrote, it's such a shame Hannah was cut down halfway through her life. Sixteen years old, I thought. Well, she was pretty old, thirty-five. Staying in Tucson a lot tonight, this is interesting. Uh, my parents were, um, well, we didn't have enough to go around a lot of the time. And I don't know if they did this in Iowa, but in Arizona there were a lot of people who came and they'd set up these fake subdivisions and sell the same lots again and again and again. They do that in Iowa too? Not so much, huh? But in Arizona that was in the 50s um, and in the 60s. That was big business and a lot of those um, People made a lot of money and then ran away, but they would always set up free food, and so my parents took us there for um, entertainment and for the food. It's called Land Fraud Nosebleed. In Sonoran Desert around Tucson, some developments rose up fast as bad dreams, each house the same as every other one on the block. Other places, carpetbaggers made promises made people see their dreams. They sold lots, sold the same lots over and over, then disappeared. For entertainment, for free food, my folks took us. They listened to the pitch, but never bought a thing. They scammed the scam artist there in the desert. I thought about the land, about the people who came before us about people who stayed. We'd be, out, we'd be out in the desert 15 miles from Fort Huachuca, checking out the latest bogus development, street signs tilting in caliche. No water, no electricity, just salesmen yapping like freshly groomed poodles, and my strapped parents nodding, nodding, but never talking, never signing, just polite till the Mexican cooks opened the pit and free barbecue smoke watered our eyes and mouths. Right then, on cue, my mother'd glance over just as my nose flooded, blots big as summer raindrops staining my crop top and shorts, and salesmen running up with a Dixie cup of crushed ice, almost heaven if I didn't hold it too long to the bridge of my nose. Then plates of shredded beef and pinto beans, green chilies and white bread appeared like mirages. Plenty, enough, too much. So we ate what we could, said thanks, really. Foiled the rest and balanced paper plates on bare knees all the way. Tissues mashed to my tilted back face, getting away with it all the way home. Saguaros tied up in surveyor's tape, cacti packing heat, held their own seeds hostage on high, Apache tears packed buckshot tight. The cracker box trailer office got hauled off to the next patch of creosote and jumping cactus. The dirt stayed. Trash hung around, blew off with dust devils, snagged on barbed wire. Before the heat of the day, uprooted Yaqui women whose third language tasted metallic, sharp blades of English on the tongue, 
throws, lifted saguaro ribs and ocotillo spikes to whack down fruit out of reach. They picked up those strong enough not to split, left behind those broken, bleeding into a new generation. Okay, this is your two-piece warning, and because it's almost Day of the Dead, you guys know about Day of the Dead? Dia de los Muertos? I'll read you just a couple pieces of that. On Dia de los Muertos, people set up altars to welcome back those who've gone before. In the Sonoran Desert, where the dead are said to cherish fragrances, paths of marigolds help the ancestors find their way. It's not mournful at all. Music, singing, dancing, a candlelight vigil, huge spreads of food. After the dead have tasted their favorite dishes, living people feast on homemade tortillas hot <coughs> off the coman. Husky tamales, meat, green corn, sweet. Skull-shaped candies, breads, cookies, the gritty bone dust, the panocha. Saladitos turn every mouth into a watering hole. Fry bread starts out flat, then puffs in hot oil, its emptiness honeyed. On the altars, pictures of loved ones out of reach, loved ones forever the age they were when they left, tokens of lives, a fishing lure, skate key, spurs, carbate for frothing hot chocolate, pierced earrings, locket, dancing shoes, size tiny, a lizard skin cowboy boot planted with jumping cactus, calavera candles flickering, calacas, skeletons riding motorcycles, getting married, having babies, skeletons at typewriters, skeletons on the roller coaster, Skeletons playing billiards, every ball on the table a skull. Calacas riding horseback, their holsters flapping. Calacas playing cello and violin, the tune just beyond our hearing. And I will end, because you ought to know how a book ends with the last bit. And this is another Day of the Dead piece, but this one takes place on Whitby Island, Washington. To celebrate that we're not among them, we choose Day of the Dead for our first post-wreck ride. We air up the tires, strap on our helmets, take deep breaths. Balance is still tricky. I can't quite tell what's flat and what's not. Can't quite tell when my foot will touch ground. Extra dark sunglasses give my eye a break. When one pupil doesn't react, sunshine hurts. I force out of my mind visions of falling, visions of me and the bike tangled in blackberry brambles, visions of cars swerving but not missing. Every muscle in my body's on alert. It's as if I have to give orders for each motion. The focus this morning reminds me of the day I got glasses after a childhood of seeing blurry. Each blade of grass stands out, distinct. Each chip of gravel, each glint of glass. To mount, I lean my bike so far over the pedal touches. Joe holds me steady while I balance on one foot. My right leg, the hurt leg, clears the hurdle, fishes a moment in midair, finds the pedal. I straighten, balance, 
breathe. I look both ways, outside, inside. We push off, wobbly, into the rest of our lives. I'm going to say thank you, but first I want to tell you there are two really kind women who brought books. I would appreciate it if you didn't make them haul back every one of them. <laughs> thank you for sharing this time. Mary just asked me if I'd answer questions. Um, if you don't want to hear this part, you can go away. If you do want to, <laughs> no, truly, because I know a lot of people, I appreciate that you came and I appreciate that you listen. And if you don't want to listen to questions, you can go away. But if you do want to listen to questions, you can ask some. We have a mic up here. Is this one Make sure you buy a book on your way out. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. Come on up and ask. Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a question about how you write and uh, how, what you might feel your style might be. And um, I, I thought this early on when you began, that, uh, when you described getting vision for the first time, I would do kind of the same thing as a child. Yeah. Do you find that that's uh, kind of a description of your style as well? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, the thing about getting vision, that I feel sometimes like poems come up to me, and I like that idea. I also like the idea that if I'm paying attention, a lot more poems are going to arrive. So I think a lot of the time it's a matter of training ourselves to be open and to being sure that all of our senses are on alert and then matching up language with what it is that we perceive. Sure. But I think from the time I was this tall, I was making stories and poems. And I just didn't know. I was the first one in my family who went to college, and I didn't know it was something that anybody did. But I finally figured out. About my second year in college, I finally figured out, I love to read, and somebody had to write all these books. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's something I could do, too. <laughs> Was that close to yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. By the way, that's the number one thing that we need to do as writers is read. We read something, we write something. We show in our writing an influence from what we've loved that we've read. We read something else, we write something else, but they're intertwined inextricably. Thank you for that reading. It was very moving. Um, I was thinking as you were reading that um, maybe the book is not so much a memoir as a book-length poem. Um, did you have any feeling like that when you were writing those pieces? They have uh, some of the movement um, and lineation of, of poems. Some of the pieces lived double lives as line poems, and some of them began as line poems. When I put the manuscript together, I had some poems and some prose, and I, I ran it by a developmental editor, a friend of mine named Don Morano, and she said, you can do this, and you're going to make your life about twice as hard as it has to be, because booksellers won't know where to put it, editors won't know where, how to classify it, your publisher is going to go nuts trying to figure out how to market it, so take your pick. And so those seemed like compelling arguments, and I transformed all the pieces that were poetry into a prose form, and I like them. So some of them move exactly the way poems work. Others are just highly compressed, like the piece about the moving water and the kid riding the flash flood. That one started off as a piece of short prose, and there are parts of it that move like a poem and other parts that don't so much. But it began as a piece of prose, and so some of them did, and some of them don't. One of them, one piece is just a letter. It doesn't have any pretension to be anything but a letter. There's another little tiny piece that's a joke, and that's all it's there for is to be a joke. So the form is pretty elastic. You can do a lot of things, but some of my natural inclination is to compress the language because that's what I like. Yeah. Thanks. But I like the idea of the book being a book. One long poem. <laughs> I have a friend who, when he's putting together a book of poems, he thinks of the book. If there are 49 poems in the book, he thinks of the book itself as the 50th poem. That's not a bad way to think about it. I was telling Mary earlier, some people talk about memoir in terms of a tapestry with different threads weaving out, in and out, or they think of it as 
maybe a mosaic with all these little tiles that make up a bigger image. But I think of this book as a kaleidoscope. There are shards. Some are sharp edged, some are brightly colored. They're unlike one another. And there's reflection involved and refraction. But if you move it just a little, the whole image changes. So I like that image. <laughs> other questions? He's on his cell phone, <laughs> so we can. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys can stand up and yell if you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've noticed that you had in that book just lots of, it just seemed like it started with your childhood and maybe ended to somewhere like now, or close to being now. It just seemed like you spanned, a, like, is it a life memoir? Or what? how did you choose? How did you know what parts did go in? Is there a common thread? Well, I would say it went beyond, beyond my life in terms of the, the past. Um, I went back several generations and there are just little bits and pieces. You might think of a biography as a story of a life and a memoir maybe as glimpses from a life. And that's more what this is. It's little bits and pieces. Um, how I decided what went in and what stayed out, um, I think there's a really strong parallel between recovering from the wreck and recovering from a childhood that was chaotic at best and harrowing at worst, and the kind of recovery from, I had two alcoholic parents, so recovering from that and recovering from being squashed are not that different, and so I think those two threads are pretty similar. Um, I left out one really long piece that, there, there is, in the last section of the book, there are several scuba diving pieces, and there was a really long one that I left out simply because by its length and by its complexity, I think it stood apart from these. Um, I left out a lot of pieces that really belonged in my next book of poems. And so I just left those out because they, they're doing different work. Yeah. And how do you decide what to leave out when you're putting things together? Are you at that stage? Um, well, I think um, I had never tried to write an entire life before, or um, try to draw connections throughout an entire lifespan. So I guess that I was kind of overwhelmed by that. But that makes sense when you said that that, that there was parallelism between that. So. Yeah. By the way, you cannot write an entire life. You cannot do it. I mean, even if you tried to write one hour, you could not do one hour. And other people who shared that hour with you would say, "Well, you got this part wrong." And that's not the way I remember it. It's okay for your information to be incomplete. It is okay for your vision of it not to be the entire truth, because guess what? We don't have access to the whole truth. We don't have access to everything that happens in a given instant. And that's very, I find that very liberating when I finally told myself, you don't have to know everything. And yours isn't, yours isn't the only version. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if anybody doesn't want to talk in the mic, you can yell out your question. I had one more question about voice. Because um, as I was listening to you read, there is a breathlessness kind of in the reading in the lines. That the lines are, many of the lines are sort of shorter. And I wondered if that was an aspect of the experience of sort of breathlessness that came from the physiological experience of recovery? I think there are conscious choice thing on your part as you crafted the pieces? There are lots of places in here where the, the um, sentences, so-called sentences, are really fragments or they're pieces. And yes, there are places where that's absolutely deliberate. But again, I'll go back to the, the moving water piece about the kid on the arroyo. There's that one part that just floods. And it just keeps going, and it's completely out of control, and that was, I think, necessary. But I liked following up that big, long um, gush of words with a forward sentence. Or um, there, there's another piece in here called Churning, 1924, and the whole first page of it is one sentence. I like playing with sentences, and I think that um, whether you're writing poetry or prose, the rhythms that you get going in your sentences have a whole lot to do with the meaning you're going to put across to your readers. And so the more different kinds of sentences 
you can make, the more nuances of meaning you can build into your piece. And so play with them, have a good time with them. And if you look in here and I've broken a rule that someone has set for you or that you've set for yourself, see if you can adapt that as a tool for your own toolbox. And see what you can do to make the language alive. How many of you here write? So a lot. Good. I'm glad. And by the way, if in your classes, I don't know if any of you, if any of you received this book in your classes, it was almost a gift, but not quite, because what I would like to propose is an exchange. I've given you this book in exchange for a copy of your first book. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if you are the sort of person who wants to ask a question privately, please talk to me. Thanks for being here.